Let us not forget everything that happens is by the will of a holy will. It's time to unite and say that we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or to live in but to stand together. Followers streaming every day. There is platforms. Trust me, you'll find a way. Soon the followers. Soon the followers. Presenting volume two of Diluting Al Wala Wal Bara, part of the Right Belief series, the Unveiled Trilogy. Written by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid. This book will focus on awakening the faith in a non faith centered world. Explained, broken down, and brought to you unlike before by Ustada Leila Nashiba. Join us Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on Sona Followers. Ina alaham duty la wa salat wa salam Allah wa rasulullah. Welcome to our uh, first class for tonight here at Suna Followers. And that last advertisement that we uh, put up, guys, uh, I want to remind everybody that this Friday, inshallah, this Friday at 9 p.m. for my uh, Ask Sister Layla live show, we have another special presentation with our two guests, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Dramali and Brother uh, Muhammad Ziada. Brother Muhammad Ziada is a law enforcement uh, agent, and he will be here, and we will be discussing. And I want you guys to pass that around. I did make a short, and I did share it on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and all the other, and Instagram. Uh, we will be discussing the dangers, the dangers of social media influencers, the dangers of social media influencers, because we're living in the day of the Ruwaybida. Who are the Ruwaybida? They're social media influencers, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, and uh, many of the people will um, influence you socially uh, under the guidelines of Islam, when in reality, these are brothers and sisters who have no knowledge, no understanding of the basics of Islam. They're not qualified to even talk about Islam, but they do it uh, uh, for the money, because there's a lot of money to be made on YouTube. And you all know that social media brings forth a lot of money. All you got to do is get a million subscribers. If you can get a million subscribers, you can make millions of dollars, as you all know, and not have to work a real J-O-B in your life. And that's what a lot of these young Muslim men and women are doing now. They're making YouTube channels, TikTok channels, Facebook channels, and uh, they have the gift of gab. They're able to speak articulately and they're beautiful to look at. We have to keep our appearance nice. You know, that's why I try to look nice too. We have to be, we're supposed to be beautiful in our appearance as long as we are dressed in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah. And uh, uh, and then they, 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 they get you in. They talk about things that you want to hear, like marriage. They talk about things that appeal to the soul, like sex. They talk about things that are bad and dirty, because that's what attracts the human soul, that which is bad and dirty. 
you know, and they even indulge in a lot of backbiting, slander, kafir calling, debating with Christians and all of that, these Muslim uh, social media influencers. And they do it, you know, to appeal to the criminal nature of yourself so you will subscribe to their channels. And we're going to talk about that. Because remember, our soul is attracted to all that bad stuff that you hear. There's our soul is attracted to all that debating and arguing and fighting and Kaffir calling and all of that. So that's going to be our topic. And Brother Muhammad Ziada, you know, who is a law enforcement agent, he will speak about uh, his experiences uh, with this, how it destroys the youth of this nation because it's pushing the youth of this nation in a negative direction, how it destroys the women. I'm going to speak about it. I am going to speak about how it's destroying the women of this nation, how these social media influencers are causing women to apostate from Islam at high rates because of the garbage that they're telling women that they can't do and the garbage they're telling women that they should do for a man. So we're going to talk about that. That's this Friday, you know, from 9 to 11 p.m. Please mark that down on your schedules. Uh, uh, the Ask Sister Layla Live show, special guest brother Mohammed Ziada and Dr. Ibrahim Durmali, who is one of our resident scholars here at Sona Followers. Okay. So I put out a lot of shorts yesterday. Um, yeah, the sisters had asked me a question yesterday and you know, I'm going to answer the question thoroughly. I'm not going to give y'all no little yes, no answers. Like a lot of these social media, Islamic social media influencers do. You know, I'm going to give you the answer based on what Allah says, based on what the prophet said. And I'm going to give you examples from the companions because that's the way we roll. Those of us who are truly upon you, the way of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the first generation of Muslims. So I didn't know that I answered that sister's question, but I didn't know it would turn into such a good thing. So I made some shorts. Did you guys see the shorts I put out? Uh, the people here on YouTube, Facebook, Sakina, uh, Margaret, Amina, did you guys see the shorts I put out from yesterday's talk about uh, there's a, the, the thin line between obedience and worship? Did y'all see my shorts? I put out three of them. Yeah, you know, because a lot of you sisters like that. I tried to emphasize the three main parts and they're only 30 second shorts they're real shorts like 30 seconds yeah i hope they help you guys because i want you sisters to keep that in mind there is a thin line between obedience and worship your soul is going to push you to worship someone where your the the fitter of your heart is trying to tell you to balance it yeah, you liked it too? I mean, a good. Yeah, I try to keep it. And I know we got too many shorts out there. You know, I got Brother Ahmad and Sister Geechee working with me, but I just, you know, I know just I let them know we don't need to be doing the same thing over and over again. So we just be patient with sooner followers. You know, we're working on it. We're trying to get it together and be more professional. You know, I have to reinforce again, don't go behind somebody and do the same short, you know. In fact, won't be no more shorts for a minute. So y'all can digest the ones that's out, okay? So, so just bear with us. But you like the ones I put out. And Geechee put a couple of, uh, out too. And Brother uh, Emma put some out too. All right. So just check out the shorts. And we're going to hold off on the shorts for a minute. But uh, uh, yeah, I tried to emphasize that because there's a thin line between obedience and worship. You know, we were created to worship Allah. That's what the fitra is all about. We were created to worship Allah. We were not created to worship a human being or, you know, not your mother, not your father. Some of you parents are bad with that too. And I did mention that yesterday. There are some parents 
who try to make their children think that they're supposed to obey them in every single thing they say. And that's not true. You know, we obey our parents regarding the things that Allah commanded us to obey them in, just like with the husband. We obey these people of authority in regard up to what's the limit? The limit is what Allah told you to obey them in. And that's it. That's it. That's it. If your parents tell you to do something that contradicts the law, we tell them no way, Jose, to. Okay? Your mother tells you, you know, that she doesn't want you to wear hijab. No way, Jose. It's just that simple. Because this is something my Lord commanded me to do. Of course, you say it in a nice way. And believe it or not, your mother is always going to test you. This is for the kids with the little question they ask me. Your mother is always going to test you, no matter how old you are. I'm 62 years old, and my mother still will test me. If I were to decide to marry somebody, do you know my mother thinks that she can tell me who to marry? When she can't. If I wanted to get married, my mother to this day believes that if I chose to marry a uh, uh, Genghis Khan, say I said I'm going to marry Genghis Khan, my mother think that I got to listen to her. No, I don't, sweetheart. You ain't my guardian, number one. And number two, I'm an old woman. Can't nobody stop me from getting married. Not you, not my brothers, nobody. Because the prophet said, any woman that's experienced knows herself better than you know her. And you can't stop me. Okay, so you're going to deal with the thing with your mother all your life. And I'm going to tell you where that comes from. Because so many Muslims were deceived into believing that paradise is under the throne of, uh, the, of their, the foot of their mother. That hadith is not authentic. That's a fabricated hadith. Paradise is not under the foot of your mother. That, is, that hadith is made up, okay? But that's why a lot of people uh, think, oh, if my mother tell me to do something, I have to, even if it's against what Allah says, nope. 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 So this is something that we have to understand as Muslims. Allah comes first and foremost. We choose him over our mother, over our father, over our husband, over our children. Some women here will worship their kids. Some of you women are obedient to your children. How many of you sisters got sons who live in your house with you and they selling drugs? We're going to talk about that on Friday too, because that's a big problem. I got a lot of sisters here who love their kids so much, especially them boys. You know that your son is selling drugs from out of your house and you allowing him to do it? because he's just a knucklehead. That's what one sister told me. One sister told me, oh, Sister Layla, what am I supposed to do? He's a good boy. He's just a knucklehead. You supposed to put him out. He's a 23-year-old knucklehead that's selling drugs from out of your house. You're allowing it. Or is he your God? What does the law say about that? So we're going to talk about all that. So again, that obedience, that's why I put that short out. You know, there's a thin line between obedience and worship. Obedience and worship. We have to have that love for a law and that wala for a law that those female companions that we talked about had. That example, the wife of Julie Beebe that we went over yesterday. Her parents did not want her to marry Julie Beebe. Her mother threw a fit 
said over my dead body will I allow my daughter to marry that deformed man. She stood up to her mother. She stood up to her father. She recited the verse of the Quran where Allah says, if the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes a decision, you have no choice but to obey him. And what he said, she recited that verse and she looked at her mother, looked at her father and said, now take me to the prophet so he can marry me to this man. Okay, so y'all have to get it together. We need to have that type of allegiance. Allah doesn't give any human being on this planet that much power over you. Not your parents, not your husband, no one. Allah doesn't put anyone equal to him. This world is meant to be a test for us to see if we believe in him. Are you gonna choose your mama over Allah, over the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That was that young girl's test. Her mother said, I'm your mother. I'm your mother. She said, but you are not my Lord. And that is the messenger of Allah. He said for me to marry him. So I'm marrying him. Are you gonna have that type of strength and resilience? Most of us don't today. We're weak, just weaklings. That's why I'm doing a story of those female companions. So you guys can see, we have to learn how to strike the balance. Remember as Muslims, we are people of dignity, humility, and balance. Balance in our love. Balance in our allegiance, balance in our disassociation. El wala, well, bara, and balance. And that's what we've been speaking about here. Everybody understand? Okay, so for those of you who, have, who are new and who have not yet bought the book, this is our Aqida class, the most important class that is taught here. And we are studying from the book written by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid. This, in fact, this is a trilogy. We went over the, we did the first book called Get to Know Your Lord, because that's what it's all about. It's all about getting to know Allah. Once you embark upon this beautiful way of life, the first thing you have to do is get to know your Lord, get to know Allah, get to know what he requires of you. Get to know what he commands us to do, what to believe. And we cover that in the first wonderful book, Get to Know Your Lord. And then we did the second of the trilogy, Diluting Well I Well Better, Volume 2, which is the second part of that Shahada. Get to know your Lord is La ilaha illallah, the first part. Diluting well and well better, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is the second part. It talks about our allegiance as Muslims. Our allegiance is supposed to be to Allah first and foremost, then to the Prophet Muhammad as that beautiful companion whose name is unknown to this day. The wife of Julebib. Her name is unknown, but her virtues and her merits have gone down in history. She was able to distance herself from what her parents wanted her to do. Because there's no obedience to you over Allah and his messenger. Y'all understand that? Okay, so make sure you guys who are new here go to amazon.com and you need to buy volume one. And this is a two volume, this is volume two. We, we completed, it took us a whole year. We, it took us a year to do the first book, Get to Know Your Lord. It took us another year to do the second book, 
which is was diluting well I well better volume one we just have it began uh volume two which is over 500 and some pages it'll probably take us two years because we doing two pages we can only do two pages at a time. There's so much information here that needs to be explained and addressed that it's, it's, we, we're only getting doing two pages a day. <laughs> so today we're doing pages 77 through 79. So uh, make sure you guys go to amazon.com and it's called Diluting Well or Well Better, volume two. The book is written by Karima Bouze. Get volume one. And get get to know your Lord too. Get all three books. The books are nineteen ninety nine. They're worth over a hundred nineteen ninety nine dollars. That's how valuable this knowledge is. And I'm gonna tell you something. When you get the book, you will see. You can't read it on your own. I was listening to uh, one person say uh, uh, how they. Uh, oh, I got Kareem Abuze's books but you still don't understand it because you can't teach yourself this religion. You guys can buy his books, I guarantee you. You read them, you're not gonna understand nothing. You have to have a person of knowledge such as myself teach you, okay? You cannot teach yourself this slime. And this is another problem we're going to address on Friday about social media influencers. These are self-taught men and self-taught women. That's why they're leading you straight to the hellfire. You cannot teach yourself this deen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you have to sit with the people of knowledge and learn directly. I didn't teach myself this, Dean, okay? I was born Muslim, even though I'm of Arabic background, I was raised in the USA, but I learned from true scholars of the ulama beginning at the age of seven. I didn't teach myself. I learned from real scholars of the Ulama, and I have one living, one that's still living today, and y'all met him on the Q&A a couple of weeks ago, that was Abu Atayat, okay? So we can't teach ourselves. You buy the book, you read it, you're going to still walk around blowing bubbles. You're not going to know what is going on. So that's why we have these classes here. And alhamdulillah, a lot of you are benefiting uh, from uh, my class here. So get the book. And by the way, the money is not expensive. The money that you guys are spending on these books, they go to help fund SafaUSA.org. That's the online school that Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid has put together. You know, and I encourage all of you to put your children you know, and SafaUSA.org homeschool, okay? Put it in homeschool. Your children should be homeschooled by you through SafaUSA.org, which is the school that Sheikh Kareem Abuze put together. His tuition is very inexpensive. That's how he can keep the prices down because the money that he makes from the books you know, uh, helps to keep those, uh, to pay for the, the teachers and all of that. So please guys, uh, go to uh, amazon.com and buy all three. Get to know your Lord, Diluting Well or Well Better, volume one, which we covered both of them. And now this is volume two. And for those of you who are new, don't worry, because I'll be teaching this class again. So if you missed out on volume one and uh, you missed out on Get to Know Your Lord, don't worry, we'll get to it again. I'm gonna go around again with it. So don't worry. All right, so today, Alhamdulillah, today we're covering pages 77 through 79. Take your books out. Yesterday, we spoke about how, how we can reignite our hearts. In other words, how to bring a dead heart or a sick heart 
What's a dead heart? What's a sick heart? This is a Muslim who uh, hasn't been practicing their religion or hasn't been practicing it well. So their faith is weak or their faith has totally disappeared. And we talk about faith, we're talking about your belief in Allah. What can I do to revive my heart, to wake it up, to wake up the light of the fitra, to get me back on track with Allah? We spoke about some things we can do to awaken that. And then yesterday we also spoke about, however, there are pitfalls too. Once you awaken that light back up, or once you even attempt to uh, get yourself back on track in practicing your deen, shaitan will throw things at you. He will do things to try to take you back away from Allah. That's what we spoke about yesterday. Well, today we're going to continue on. So let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. And by the way, for everyone listening, my students particularly, make sure you screenshot uh, on using your phone or whatever you're using. When I put the PowerPoints up, I use PowerPoint. I am a professional teacher. I'm a professional dyer, but I'm also a professional teacher. Hello. <laughs> yeah, got to put some humor in here. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so take, uh, when I put the PowerPoint up, take screenshots. So you can print the PowerPoint out at the end of the class from your phone and then staple it together and attach it to page 77 of the book because that's where the page will, today's lecture will begin. Hold on, I'm trying to, okay, let me, okay. Oh, I can do it on one. The brother showed me how to do it on one computer, right? Okay, for the brother to help me, here I go again today. <laughs> let me try it. Uh, he showed me, how did he tell me to do it? He said, go to Zoom. Uh, okay, I'm coming to you guys first and share you. Okay. Give me a second, guys. I'm doing what this brother taught me to do yesterday. I got it written down here. Okay, hold on. I'm mean, y'all going to see the space. Do everybody else will see the space? People in Zoom. Let me share y'all to the right thing. He said, I share you to this. Okay, that's you. You guys are shared. And didn't he tell me to cut off my camera, right? He said, cut off your camera. So cut off the camera. And then go here for everybody else. Put up the PowerPoint. Allow. I got to walk, talk to walk myself through it. Bam. Can everybody see now? People on Zoom, can y'all see my the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, okay, hold on. I did it right, I'm so excited. Hold on, hold on. Okay, hold on, I wrote it down. Let me let the brother know. He's, he's uh, uh, by the way, he's texting me, he's on standby. Oh, I got it, look, look, look. Oh, he says he sees it, okay. Thank you. All right, okay. So now let's make it big screen by, let me follow my steps. He said, click on the PowerPoint, I just did. Now, just work your PowerPoint. And my camera's off, right? He said, work your PowerPoint. There we go. Here, can everybody see the one page? Did I do it? Yes. Oh, okay, I did it. Thank you, brother. All right, so we're going to be covering pages 79, something 77 through 79. Yesterday, we spoke about the pitfalls that stand in the way of your uh, uh, faith increasing. Well, today we're gonna cover how there are certain behaviors that you may indulge in or that I may indulge in as a Muslim that can prevent us from growing spiritually. Because once we awaken our faith, once my belief in Allah has been revived, the key now is to keep it Keep it growing. And your personal gene is not going to like that. He doesn't like that your faith has been uh, revived. So he's going to try to whisper to you to do things that you shouldn't do that will stand in the way of you continuing to grow closer to Allah. So let's look at some of those things. 
And one of the things that he'll do is he'll make you tolerate doing things that are haram. Okay? He'll make you do things, accept behavior, or engage in actions that contradict the teachings of Islam. What does that mean? Innovation. Okay, your personal jinn, he sees that you are now making your prayers. So what he's going to do is try to get you to innovate. What's one of the number one innovations that people do when they pray? After they finish praying, they blow in their hands and make do and wipe over their face. No, this is wrong. The supplication should be made when you are prostrating. He, you know, you should make whatever personal supplications you have should be made when you're prostrating. And despite what people tell you, your personal supplications can be in any language, whatever language you speak, not Arabic. Personal supplications are not the same as the specific supplications. Personal supplications can be in whatever language you speak because language comes from a law. He's the creator of all language. There's even a hadith that says the angels that surround uh, the throne of Allah, they glorify and praise Allah in every language known by man and language is not even known by us because they all came from Allah. So when you hear these rigid brothers make you Muslims feel like you can never talk to Allah unless you speak Arabic, I'm sorry, that's racism. That's just another form of, of, of superiority. Remember, we talked about that yesterday. The human soul wants to be superior than others. We got some Arabic men and Arabic women that want to think that they because they're Arabic, they're better than you. Allah didn't make no mistake in giving you English as a language. You had nothing to do with it. And just to let you guys know, Arabs haven't spoken the classical Arabic in centuries. Okay? So your personal supplications can be in whatever language you speak. And the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told us to increase your supplications when you are prostrating because that is the most humble position that man can take before his Lord. That's an authentic hadith, the source, the source, Bukhari and Muslim. And he did not say it has to be in Arabic. Where? There is nothing, nothing, no hadith sit that says it has to be in Arabic, not your personal supplications. Now the Tashahu. That's different. That's Arabic because the prophet taught us how to say the Tashahud in Arabic. The Fatiha, that must be in Arabic because Fatiha is not in English. It's in Arabic. But your personal dua, whatever language you speak. So this is an example as to how your personal jinn will try to get you to engage in actions that contradict the teachings of Allah. Then he'll try to make you make dua after the prayer or not make personal dua at all because some nincompoop, some nincompoop told you because you speak, don't speak Arabic, you can't talk to Allah in your language. Both of those examples are examples of this. And so many Muslims as a Daya, I was born and raised in the USA, even though my father's Egyptian. I am from the El Sadat family, El Sadat. But I, and I have seen in my 62 years, too many Muslims tell me that they don't talk to Allah because somebody told them they don't speak Arabic. So Allah only hears the uh, person in Arabic. Where's the Dalil? Abraham, Allah took Prophet Ibrahim as a personal friend. Did Ibrahim speak Arabic? No, he did not. Jonah was in the belly of a whale 
and he called upon a Lord, may do us so much that the fish in the sea supplicated with him. Did the fish speak Arabic? Did Jonah speak Arabic? No. Moses. Allah doesn't mention any prophet in the Quran more than he does Moses. And Allah spoke directly without into any angel to Moses. Did Moses speak Arabic? No, he did not. So I want y'all to get over this, uh, uh, this, these misconceptions because these misconceptions that y'all hear from speakers that don't base their information on authentic hadiths, you know, they can cause you to engage in actions that contradict the teachings of Allah. We have to be aware of that. Also, another thing that can stand between your spiritual growth, and I'm here to tell you guys, how can you establish ibadah or personal relationship with Allah if you don't talk to him? People been Muslim for 50, 60, 70 years and never talked to Allah because they were told they don't, they can't because they don't speak Arabic. That definitely will stand between you strengthening your spiritual tie to him. Also, so be careful, be careful who these speakers are y'all listening to. If they telling you crap like that and they don't have the clear nas, the clear verse, remember the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said the lawful and the unlawful have been clearly defined by Allah. If someone tells you something is haram, there's going to be a clear verse. Where's the clear verse that says Allah doesn't hear you unless you speak Arabic. You cannot talk to your Lord in no language but Arabic. You're saying Allah made a mistake. A stuck for Allah. Be careful who y'all listen to. All right. Another uh, uh, thing that can stand in the way of your spiritual growth is hanging around and associating with, uh, with the heedless people. What are the heedless people? The people that don't practice Islam. The people that, that don't wear hijab. You sisters should not be personal, intimate friends with any woman who does not wear a hijab and dress in an abaya. Because our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a person takes on the religion of his or her associates. And you shouldn't be a personal, intimate friends with non-Muslims at all, period. Okay? So uh, bad behavior, the bad behavior of surrounding yourself with people who don't listen to Allah, people who don't take this religion seriously, you know, this will stand in the way of you getting closer to Allah. And you better hope that Allah don't send a lightning bolt down on you. And I want you guys to remember, Allah tells us in the Quran and in the interpretation of the meaning, do not sit in the company of those who commit sin. Why would I sit in the company of a bunch of sisters that don't wear hijab? Why would I sit in the company of a bunch of people that smoke cigarettes, smoke drugs? Why would I be in the company? You know, of people who disobey a law. If a law decides to send a, 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 a th thunderbolt, it's going to hit you too. So, associating with people who are heedless to the words of a law, this is going to stop you from growing spiritually. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the companions to surround yourself with strong Muslims. Who were the Prophet's best friends? His closest friends were Abu Bakr and Umar. And Abu Bakr and Umar are the strongest of this nation. Abu Bakr will be the first person to enter paradise after the Prophet Muhammad. And Umar will be the second. And they were his closest associates. 
Uh, uh, excuse me, moderators, take care of that person on the mic. Okay, also, another thing that will stand in the way of your personal growth or your connection with Allah is negative self-talk followed by uh, pessimism. What do I mean by that? This is something as a diet and as an American Muslim that I noticed, you know, I grew up in the 60s. Oh, yeah. I grew up here in America, and, I, you know, in the 60s, that was the civil rights movement in America's history. It was all about black pride. And it was all and, and it was all about Islamic pride for me, for my people that I was with. And one of the things that I was raised upon as a child is you are la creme de la creme. That's what my mother used to tell me. My mother's Creole. She would say, Tu es la creme de la creme. You are the cream of the crop. The cream of the crop. No one is better than you who does not believe Muhammad because back when I grew up, we didn't have no Islamic schools in the 60s. You know, there was no Islamic this. In fact, a lot of people didn't even know what Sunni Islam was. It was all about Elijah Muhammad. I didn't come from Elijah Muhammad. SubhanAllah, I was always raised upon the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not every Muslim in America is from Elijah Muhammad. My community ain't, I'm not, Mukhtar ain't, none of us. We were raised upon Suratul Mustaqim. And when we were raised, we were taught that we are the best. No one can outdo us in anything. I remember my stepfather and my mother telling me, Layla, don't ever underestimate yourself. You can do anything you want to do. You can fly if you want. My mother told me that. And to this day, I said, I can fly if I want. And I can. If I want to learn how to fly an airplane, I can learn it. I can teach myself and I can do it. I can put on some of those wings and, and skydive too if I want to, okay? We have to get this self-respect back. Back in the 60s, we had self-love, self-respect, self-confidence. This is the inner pride that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us is, uh, is, is incumbent to have in order to be a believer. He said, there's two different types of pride, inner pride and outer pride. One of the companions said, what's the difference? And another companion said, oh, prophet of Allah, I like to wear nice shoes and I'm proud of the nice shoes I have. Is this the type of pride that's going to take me to hell? The prophet said, no, that's inner pride. We have to have a love for yourself, respect for yourself, and confidence and appreciation of the things you work hard to do. He said the type of pride that's haram is the arrogance. It's when you take the inner pride and you begin to think that you are superior over others that no one is equal to you, that you are better and above others. That's the type of pride that will damn you to the hellfire forever. That's the a sin of disbelief. That's the type of pride Iblis has. We need to learn the difference between the two. Because so many children today in 2024, they have no self-respect, no self-love. They put themselves down. They doubt themselves. They grew up to be adults that have self-doubt. They focus more on their flaws instead of the good. Remember, the prophet Muhammad taught us to look to the good in things. And there's good in everything. You recognize your faults and try to correct them. 
But don't sit there. Remember, everything is balanced. Don't sit there and focus on your faults to the point where you think that you are insufficient and you are not worthy of being forgiven. We have to learn as Muslims to implement wala wal better allegiance and disassociation. I'm going to disassociate myself from those qualities that will take me away from Allah. And I'm going to have allegiance to myself about the qualities that are good in me, that will bring me closer to Allah. It's about balance. Negative self-talk. Negative and pessimistic views of yourself. Always thinking the worst. Woe unto me. Self-pity. Self-pity comes from your iblis, your shaitan that's assigned to you. Feeling sorry for yourself. Loneliness. We got to balance that stuff out. We all get lonely, but balance it. Learn and understand that you're never alone. Those angels of mercy are always surrounding you. They're always making dua for you. Every time you recite the Quran, they put their mouth on your mouth and kiss you. Did y'all know that? When you recite the Quran, the angels of mercy put their mouth on your mouth. Subhana Allah, you're never alone. Just because we can't see the friends of Allah doesn't mean that we that they are not there. So negative talk, pessimism, all of that stuff can stand in the way of your physical growth towards Allah. Also, resistance to change. As your fitra burns bright and as your fitra tries to find its way back to Allah, that personal gene assigned to your heart, he's going to resist it. Resistance limits your potential to grow. Resistance limits your, your potential to learn. A sister tells you, wow, you know what? I was listening to this amazing woman on YouTube. Her name is Layla Nasheba. Boy, her voice, something about her voice, it woke me up. And what she was saying was so true. She was talking about the thin line between obedience and worship. I want you to come and listen to this sister. So you go and listen. I start talking. Now you're Jen. He gets to whisper in her voice. Her voice is scary. Her voice is loud. She sound like a man. I ain't never heard a woman talk that way and you never will because very few women follow the sooner today. We're living in the days in which Islam is strange. We live in the days in which people think that women are supposed to walk around sounding like Marilyn Monroe. When Allah clearly tells the believing woman, never, don't you ever soften your voice and make it sweet publicly. When you speak publicly, speak in a loud voice. But we don't know that because our faith is so weak. So that's an example, you know, resistance to change. Our gene is trying to get us to resist changing, resist finding our way back to Allah. This is where, again, El Wella and Welbara comes in. We have to disassociate from our personal gene. We have to disassociate from those rigid belief systems. Let me give an example of that. Your fitra has been lit. You're seeking, you know, Allah. Your iman is so strong that all of a sudden some brother comes and tells you that because you a woman, you can't wear a pretty hijab. You got to dress ugly and be shabby. Rigid beliefs. We have to disassociate from rigid beliefs, rigid attachments, preconceived notions, 
that stand in the way of our personal development. Does everybody understand that? We have to make dua, asking Allah, letting uh, asking Allah say, oh Allah, I want to be, I want to learn this deen. I want to learn it the correct way. Oh Allah, I want to get closer to you. Guide me to the correct knowledge. Guide me to the correct way. Allah tells us in the Quran, anyone that asks for guidance, he will guide you. If you make that supplication, he will direct you to the proper people to learn from. He will direct you to the true Islam the same way many of you have been directed here to hear from me. So resistance to change. Remember, any change for the good that you make, your personal gen is going to try to resist it. Also, another issue that stands in the way of your spiritual growth is unhealthy relationships. You're in a marriage, like I was telling you married sisters yesterday. You got an oppressive man trying to break you. Remember, the prophet warned the man against that. He said, don't bend a woman too much because you're going to break her. You are in an abusive relationship where this man doesn't want to see you grow. And there's a lot of relationships like that. You marry a man, he, he sees that you're growing in your relationship with Allah. You're practicing your deen. It makes him angry because he doesn't practice. He don't wear a beard. He doesn't pray. He doesn't go to the mosque. And now that you're practicing, he becomes emotionally abusive towards you. You got to get out of that relationship. A lot of sisters tell me, oh, Sister Layla, what do you do if you're married to a man that don't pray? Do you have to ask? If you're married to a man that don't pray, you get a divorce because Layla wouldn't be married to such a man. If a man doesn't pray, he can go. Do you think Aisha would have been married to a man that didn't pray? Do you think Um Salama would marry a man that didn't pray? Do you think the wife of Julebid would have married a man who didn't pray? If he don't pray, he shouldn't be married to you. He should have been on the curb long time ago. Unhealthy relationships erode our self-esteem. Unhealthy relationships, they impede on boundary setting, the boundary between worship and obedience. Unhealthy relationships, they interfere with the positive connections that we have with Allah and with the righteous believers. So that can stand in the way of your growth. Get rid of the unhealthy relationships. Get rid of them. And whatever you get rid of for the sake of Allah, Allah promises he'll send you better. Okay? Also, another uh, a thing that stands between your growth with Allah, your spiritual growth is giving in to the allure of the soul and the invitation of Iblis. Remember, the human soul is criminal by nature. The human soul is attracted to everything that's bad for it. We have to resist those attractions. A lot of people ask me, Sister Layla, why don't you leave the house? Why don't you go out and visit people? Because that's going to lead to trouble. I'm a nice looking woman. I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. I look pretty good. The way y'all see me, anybody know me in real life, this is how I look. And when I go out the house, I always attract the little young boys. I'm talking 20s and 30s. I'm talking green eyed, long ponytail, what they call it, the bow tail, the, the man, man tail, tall, six feet four, olive skin. They're usually Greek, Italian. I track them and they always like to hoover around. Uh, you look beautiful today. I love that uh, uh, that dress you have on. And oh my God, that thing on your head, you really stand out. Layla stays away. I don't got time to play. Ain't nothing out there but Shaitan, guys. Shaitan will test you, you know, with the things that he knows you're weak to. 
Layla's weak to the little handsome, dark, tall, uh, bo uh, boy bun, uh, uh, Italian, stallion, Greek, uh, even Turkish men. So Layla stays away. I'm a debarge girl. What can I say? I'm from the 60s. I grew up in the 80s. Debarged. Little boys that look like little girls. That's how pretty they were. So I stay home. What's out there? Trouble. Shaitan. So again, you need to know your strengths, know your weaknesses and stay away from that stuff. Don't accept the invitation of Iblis. Don't accept the invitation of Shaitan, guys. Once you accept that invitation, you can't take it back. And he will burn that fitra out so quick and have you sitting up on the curb blowing bubbles without a hijab on crying about how, how you're going to find your way back home again. Hello. Your home is better for you, sisters. Also, so we see by integrating the principles of El Well and Well Better, it's all about allegiance, having allegiance towards the law, to the, towards the prophet, to the religion and the things the law commands us to do and disassociating ourselves from those things that can take us away from a law. By doing this, this will help prevent us from falling victim to the pitfalls of bad behavior that can help burn our light back out or can keep us from making that strong connection to a law. We need to surround ourselves with strong, righteous, believing Muslims, strong, righteous, practicing Muslims. Muslims, for you brothers, you need to surround yourself with other brothers who like to pray at the mosque because the mosque is where your blessings lie. And you sisters need to surround yourselves with sisters who dress the part and like to stay at home because your home is better for you as a woman. You can connect on the internet like we do here in our Zoom room. We connect, we from all over the world. We come here and, and we, we're best of friends. We turn on our cameras, we talk, we interact here in Zoom, but we stay home because our homes are better for us. The Italian stallions will take you out and so will those Greekers. All right. So embracing El Wella well better, it empowers us to recognize and rectify our bad behaviors. We become more thoughtful in identifying the actions and thoughts that can take us away from a lot. Also, Showing our allegiance to Allah compels us to not fall victim to the pitfalls such as laziness, which is what we talked about yesterday, wastefulness, we talked about yesterday, and a lack of discipline. Instead, we replace those things with enthusiasm and purposeful pursuits and commitment to improving ourselves and helping our fitra find its way back to Allah. So the principles of El Wala Well Better will strengthen our certainty of faith to the point that we know that each day that Allah allows us to wake up, that day could be our last day on earth. So we're going to make the best choices that we can for ourselves. We're going to do the deeds that are pleasing to Allah. So in case this is our last day on earth, we go out in a good ending. And we're going to stay away from those things in this world that can cause us to doubt and question our purpose. We're going to disassociate and stay away from those things in this world that can bring about anxieties regarding our faith. Okay. Also, we're going to work hard to keep the light of the fitra in our heart burning. And the way to keep it burning again is to stay away from all the pitfalls that we talked about, about and, by, and to embrace the fact that 
we were created to worship a law, not man, not woman, not gin, not angel, not animal, not the sun, not the moon. We were created to worship a law and he put us here to test us in how we worship him. Are we going to transgress the limits? Are we going to uh, transgress the limits in our obedience to him, our obedience to our parents, our obedience to our husbands? That's the question. So now let's see how well you guys understood uh, what we discussed the past couple of days. And I really want to see if you guys were paying attention to yesterday's lecture. So I'm going to give you a quiz that's going to cover again yesterday and today. Let's look at the first question. What are some of the pitfalls that stand in the way of our spiritual growth? What are some of the pitfalls we talked about that stand in the way of our spiritual growth? Who can answer that? The one is not having self-love or self-confidence. Is that a pitfall? Have, it could be. Oh, it could be, but I'm really talking about yesterday. Oh, uh, one of them is laziness. Exactly. And just like nonsensical stuff. Exactly. Laziness. This is a pitfall. A, uh, you know, your personal gin will want you to procrastinate, to procrastinate making your prayers to do like the sister in my Zoom room. I'm not gonna name her, I hope she's in there. She said she has not fasted in two years. I mean, she did not make up her fast in two years. What the heck stopped you? You procrastinated. You allowed your gen to cause you to lose out on the reward of fasting for two years. That's a pitfall procrastination. It's a serious thing. What's another uh, pitfall, guys, that can stand in the way of our spiritual growth? Come on, guys. Procrastination. Come on. Uh, being too attached to this world. Mashallah. Thank you, uh, Awa. How many of us are too attached to this world? You don't have time to go to the mosque to pray your prayers as a man, but you got time to go play basketball every weekend with those calfers. You got time to go to the gym when you shouldn't be going to the gym because you're sitting there with all them calfer women looking at them. Good job. What's another pitfall that stands in the way of our spiritual growth? Can it be like selfish? I mean, selfish, greed. That's it. Could be, but that's not what we talked about. What did we talk about okay. yesterday? Ignorance of Allah. That's what I'm looking for. Not learning the deen. You got come up with every excuse in the world to not learn this religion. I don't like her. Her voice is too harsh. Allah said it's supposed to be. You should love her. Your voice should be like hers too, okay? Every excuse, oh, I, gotta, I got something to do, you know? I'd rather listen to this sister over here because her voice is soft and she makes me laugh. Making you laugh, is that beneficial knowledge? You'd rather listen to somebody talk about something that ain't got nothing to do with bringing you closer to a law. You're ignorant of the dean. And before you know it, you're going to die. And the angels are going to ask you, didn't Allah send messengers for you to learn from? But you chose to listen to the Ruwaybida who had you laughing. Well, now you can laugh your way to the hellfire. Okay. Any other pitfalls that stand in the um, way? On YouTube, Sister Sakina said, uh, fear of failure. Mashallah. Um, That's a big one. Fear of failure. What's the point in me struggling? This is what the Mutazilites say. What's the point in me practicing 
Allah already wrote if I'm going to be in paradise or hell. So what's the point in me trying? I ain't going to make it anyway. Good job. What else? Um, Asham said wasting time on useless things. Mashallah, wasting time watching TV, playing soccer. When that was time you could have spent here at Sunnah Followers. Our classes are every day from 6 to 10 o'clock. And on the weekends from 2 to 10 o'clock. And we're getting ready to change it, guys. Starting on the 12th, Dr. Ibrahim Darmali and Dr. Ali Shahada, who used to teach here before. They will be doing Akita classes at 10 o'clock in the morning. We getting ready to go around the clock. You getting ready to have lectures around the clock. So what's your excuse for not learning your dean? You're wasting your time on nonsense. What other questions? Go ahead. I mean, what other answers? Um, Sister Isra said, not seeking true beneficial knowledge about our religion. A lot of us don't even know the basics of Islam. Good job. What else they got? That's all they got. Um, Sister Jamila said, having ignorance, ignorance feeling like you can't talk to Allah because you listen to your weakness. Exactly. Go and ahead. Fatima said, Wor worldly obligations. Exactly. Getting caught up in your job. Oh, you know, I'm I need to go make some uh, overtime. So I ain't got time to listen to the class. You know? Stuff like that, all of those, those things y'all mentioned are pitfalls that stand in the way of our spiritual growth. Good job, I'm proud of y'all. This was from yesterday, y'all remember. And what about this? What are some of the things that we can do to awaken the light of the fitra within us? In other words, what are some things we can do to increase our iman, to increase our belief in Allah that will wake it up? That will wake up our belief in Allah, in other words. Reflect on your flaws. Good job. One of the things is reflecting on your flaws. And what do you do then? When you reflect on them, what do you do? You change your flaws from bad to good. Exactly. And how do you do that? By repenting, too. Repenting. When you look at the bad things you've done, look at the flaws within yourself. Like she said, change yourself. Allah said he will never change the condition of a person until that person makes the attempt to change the condition of himself. Look at your weaknesses. Look at the flaws. Look at the sinful actions you've done. Stop doing the sins. Feel bad about it. Be determined to never do it again and ask a lot to forgive you. And to ask a lot to forgive you and ask a lot to forgive you. And then you keep it moving. You see, you got a problem with backbiting. Stop backbiting. Start doing something productive with your mouth, like learning how to recite the Fatiha. Most Muslims here in America don't know the Fatiha correctly. Okay? Or, and they even more don't know the Tasha Hood at all. Use your tongue in a positive way. Good job. What are some other things that will awaken the light within us? Um, Sister Sakina, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say one of the things that help is by recognizing uh, the good that Allah has given us, recognizing his blessings that he has given us. Exactly. If we, Take the time. Now y'all understand what that old saying is. How many of us take the time to smell the roses? That's what that means. We get so caught up in the negativity of life. We get so caught up in the what we don't have and how bad it is. We need to take the time to smell the roses. Look at the good things Allah has given you. He blessed you with nice home, a way of maintaining yourself, providing for yourself. You got a nice car. Your health is good. You got nice hair, nice clothes, nice body. You got good children, good grandkids, good husband, good parents, nice family. If we would take the time to smell the roses in life, 
you know, to look at the blessings of Allah that are help to awaken that belief in him. That'll help us to awaken that light and make us trust in him and depend upon him because we know that he's in control of all things. Good job, Atifa. What are some more things that awaken the light? Um, okay, Sister Sakina said, uh, seeking knowledge from the people of knowledge. Um, and Halima said, seeking knowledge as well. Uh, Bin Muhammad said, admit the sins, the shortcomings, and seek forgiveness from Allah and surround yourself with righteous people practicing the deen and who will encourage you. MashaAllah, all of three of those answers are the best. Yes, we have to be regular, be consistent. We cannot fall short, guys, in learning this religion. This is how I lose a lot of Muslims. A lot of people come during Ramadan. They all pumped up. Their faith is all lit up from my classes. Then after Ramadan, they stop coming and they fall back into their sins. The prophet Muhammad said, Allah loves for us to do good deeds according to our capabilities and be consistent. You have to be regular and consistent in seeking knowledge. You can't just seek it once a year. It's got to be an everyday thing. That's why my classes are every day, every single day of the year, even on the day of the Eid. Yes. So mashallah, those are all good things. What else? Any other ones? Y'all didn't mention one that really works for me. Death. Death. You want to awaken a person's dead heart? Take them to a graveyard. Make them clean a dead body. Go to a morgue and look at them dead bodies in the morgue. Sometimes it takes something like that to awaken your life. These are for people whose hearts are completely black. These are for people whose faith is gone. A Muslim that ain't practiced, he's so caught up in the life of this world, you want to awaken his light again, you got to take him to the morgue, something like that. Or a calamity, any type of calamity or hardship. For some of us, it's the calamities that awaken the light. Okay? Next question. List some behaviors that a person may indulge in that can stand in the way of your spiritual journey? What are some behaviors that we can, may indulge in that will stand in the way of our spiritual journey back to Allah? What kind of behaviors we talked about today? Innovating in the way we worship Allah, like adding things to the prayer or stuff that we do in this inno Exactly, innovations incorrect uh, 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 practice of the obligations. Good job. What else? Procrastination, you know, like putting off the times that you may do your prayers or something like that instead of doing them, you know, in a timely fashion. Exactly. Procrastination, that's a terrible behavior that can stand in the way. What else? That's doubt. Yes. Doubting yourself. That's why I have to tell a lot of my students here, stop doubting yourself. You know the answer. Just say it. Certainty of faith is in your heart. Just don't allow your gin to make you think that it's not. Yeah, self-doubt or self-pessimism will stand in the way of your spiritual growth. Good job. What else? Being personal friends with people who are Muslim in name only and not practice or being personal friends with people who do not believe in the law. Exactly. That's real important. Who do you who are you surrounded by? Who do you associate with? You're associating with people who are weak in their faith, people that don't practice, people that are bad influences, people who are heedless to a law. They don't obey a law. So why are you sitting with them? Why are you hanging out with them? Good job. Any other behaviors? 